And again, again honored to be here. And this, this is a fun time, time a fun, fun conference, conference because, because I get, get to geek, geek out. out. You know, you know most, most times, times preaching, you got you got to guard your use of algebraic expressions because it has nothing to do with the word that you're going into. It's just fun. But today, I get to. Use, use every, every physics, physics formula I can think of. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> and, and I've titled, I've titled, I've titled today's, today's message, It Is Rocket, rocket Science. science. <laughs> I hear I Pastor, Pastor Jim, Jim, Apostle Jim, Jim say all the time, it's, it's not rocket, rocket science. science. And so, so this, this one's, one's called, called, yes, it is. It's, it's rocket, rocket science. Because <laughs> that's, that's what we're going to talk, talk about this morning. morning. Hello, Hello, Pastor Vicky. Just saw you back there. If you would turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Let's, Let's get, get into, into this. this. For, For a couple, couple years, years, I taught pre-algebra. Pre we, we actually, actually went, went further than just pre-algebra pre because, because it was my class. class. For our school, our school at, at Grace, Grace Maine, and, and some, some of the, the kids, kids would come, come in with a bad attitude, attitude towards math. math. I, don't I don't like math. math. I don't like arithmetic. I don't like all this stuff. stuff. So I would, I would start, start the, every, every, serve, every, every, every class session, session with, okay, okay here's, here's our confession. confession. Everybody, Everybody repeat after me. We're going to do it right now. I love math. I love math. Now, now keep, keep saying it until you believe. believe. <laughs> it, it will happen. happen. Praise God. God. Anybody, Anybody here really love math? math? Love science, science physics. physics. Amen. Praise, Praise God. God. We're, We're going to talk about some of that today. In Genesis chapter 1 in our account of creation, it says, it says in verse, in verse 17, 17, and God, God set, set, let me back, back up, verse 16, and, and God, God made two, two great lights, the greater light, light to rule the day and the lesser light, light to rule the night. He made, he made the, the stars, stars also. And, and God, God set, say the word set. set. God, God set, set them in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. earth. Now, now, and to rule over the day and over the night to divide the light from the darkness. And God said it was good. And, and it, it was, was the fourth, fourth day. day. It, it says, says here that God set these, these two great lights in the heavens. heavens. Now, now what, what are the, the two, two great, great lights? lights? The sun and, and the moon, moon right? right? And it and says he set them in place. place. Now, now, kind of a side note, note I've always found it interesting that after four, four days, days, how can I say this? this? Prophetic days. How many know the word says the day with the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is a day? After 4,000 years from Adam, Jesus was crucified. Amen. Right at 4,000 years, which is four days. That would be the S-O-M represented by the S-U-M. At the same time, the church is created. The church is that, that body that's, that's ordained, ordained of God, God to rule during, during the night. night. Amen. Amen. And, and it's, it's represented, represented by the moon. moon. Amen. Amen. And, and we, we know, know the, the moon, moon has, has no light of its own. own. It, it merely reflects the light of the sun. And, and to me, it's just in creation that God will put that in his word. Really a prophetic declaration of the, of the crucifixion of Christ and the church being brought forth after four days is amazing to me. Amen. Amen. But, but I, I want, want to talk, talk about, about God setting uh, these heavenly bodies in place. place. Because, because to put, put a moon in place, we'll talk about the moon around the earth. The to put, put the moon in place requires understanding of some very precise physics laws. It wasn't that God just said, okay, here's an earth, and I'll just put a moon here. I'll throw it out there. And it just sticks, because I threw it out there, it just sticks. It's magic. No, no everything, everything that operates in the, in the universe, universe follows laws of physics. Scientific, scientific laws that govern how uh, bodies interact, how, how things function. And, and one, one of the of things that Rob talked about it last night is, is the moon goes, goes around the earth in a precise, precise orbit. orbit. In fact, the moon circulates around the earth in an almost circular orbit. And that's, That's because, because there's, there's a balance, balance of two major forces. forces. You, you can put, put your, your formula, formula back up, up Rob. One, one is Newton's law of universal, universal gravitation, gravitation that, that says 
two objects in the universe, no matter how far apart, attract each other. And it's calculatable and very exact. And it's based on the mass of the first object, which in this case would be the Earth, Regarding the gravitational attraction between the moon, it's also the mass of the moon multiplied together, divided by the radius squared. Radius squared, right? Yeah, radius squared. Times a gravitational constant. And based on that formula right there, we know the Earth is 3,960 miles in radius, that we can calculate your weight Exactly, exactly based on this formula, formula. assuming Assume we know your mass. mass. And, and so, so this law attracts the moon to the earth with a large amount of force. So, so if, if the moon would just set in space out there by, you know, out around the earth somewhere, it would just collapse right into the earth. That attraction would pull it together. So to keep the moon from falling into the earth, it's countered by another force. The gravity is countered by another force, which is called centrifugal force. When something spins, that spinning motion produces an outward force. And in the case of the moon going around the earth, 240,000 miles from the center of the earth, based on that balance, the force of the moon wanting to fling out because it's going around the earth is exactly equal to the force of gravitation wanting to pull the moon into the earth. It wasn't just set there. God knew the exact velocity. He would have to put the moon in, in motion around the earth to produce a balance. God knows physics. He knew that. You know, I've got to put the moon going around the earth exactly at this speed. In fact, in our case, it goes around the earth once every uh, 27 to 29 days, circling the earth. And that exact balance keeps the moon from crashing into the earth. God doesn't just know physics. He loves physics. And the thing is, he created physics out of a realm that's equally predictable. The kingdom of heaven that birthed this universe we live in follows its own laws of physics. I call it spiritual physics or kingdom laws, kingdom keys. That if we'll learn these kingdom laws and kingdom keys, we can get heavenly results. Amen. For example, the power of your words, the power of forgiveness, sowing seed, we could go on and on. So God is a God of reliable laws. Gravity always works the same. It works the same whether you're on Earth or whether you're on the moon or on Jupiter. It follows this formula exactly. If it didn't, who would want to fly on a plane that if you're up in the air, all of a sudden gravity doubles? It's always the same. Amen. The laws of faith always produce the same. If gravity is predictable and reliable, Certainly, Certainly the laws of the kingdom are, are predictable and reliable as well, right? So up here we have a, in a circular orbit of the moon. Let me grab a marker here. And I need three pulpits just to put stuff. The force of gravitation, let's use the moon would be the gravitational constant. It's just an, uh, a very small number times the mass of the Earth times the mass of the Moon divided by the radius to the Moon squared. Do you follow me? What are you laughing about? And Rob, by the way, in... Textual language on your keyboard, the uh, symbol for going to another power is your carrot. So it would be R to the 2 represents R squared. Just for future reference. 
for next, next time, time you're teaching you this, right? So that's, that's the force, force of gravity. gravity. And, and to, to produce, produce a moon's circular orbit, orbit it's got to be exactly equal to the centrifugal force of the moon going around the Earth. And that, that formula is the mass of the moon times the velocity over the radius. Make sure I got that velocity squared. So God... Inventing, inventing physics, physics said, okay, okay. Here's, here's, what gonna, gonna, here's how I'm going to make gravity operate. operate. Here's how I'm going to make centrifugal force operate. And he says, now, I've got to calculate in my mind how fast do I need the moon moving and at what altitude or what orbit to equal the gravity I've already invented. And he set it exactly in place. Now, you may wonder what I'm getting at. What I'm getting at is scientists, evolutionists, non-God, non-word-believing people somehow want to explain how the moon got in position with a circular orbit around the earth by accident. And the majority of scientists will be honest or admit it's impossible. It couldn't, it couldn't have happened, happened by accident. accident. Or, or just say, we just don't know. It, it must, must have just happened. happened. But the, the truth, truth is, every theory for the moon being in this orbit are all uh, incorrect. I want to read you a statement out of a book. This is Dr. Walt Brown's book, In the Beginning which is the best book on creation science I've ever found. I highly recommend you get a copy of this book. And not only that, it's already online free. You can type in Dr. Walt Brown in the beginning, find the, the right website. When you click on it, it brings up the book, and you can go to the entire book. Every piece of it. And even more, he's added two more online that's in this book. And read the entire book online. Free. And so, Dr. Walt Brown was a uh, mechanical engineer, who still is, from MIT. One of the most prestigious universities in the world. And he was so disgusted by people talking about God creating, creating everything. He went about to prove how creationists are full of hire, basically, to disprove creation. And so doing so, he, he was an atheist. Through much time and study, he came to the conclusion, science is wrong. True science is right. Physics always works. But scientists have made up explanations that do not work. And evolution is a lie. He got born again. And wrote this phenomenal book. Amen. It explains Noah's flood, how it took place, how we get the mountains, the ocean bases, everything. But just a great, great book. And one statement he made in this book, I want to read to you, regarding the origin of the moon. His evolutionary theories for the origin of the moon are highly speculative and completely inadequate. The moon could not have spun off of the earth because its orbital plane is too highly inclined. Nor could it have formed from the same material as earth because the relative abundances of the moon's elements are too dissimilar from those of the earth. It's not made of the same stuff, not the same balance of, of elements. The moon's nearly circular orbit is also strong evidence that it was never torn from or captured by the earth. If the moon form the particles orbiting Earth, other particles should, should be easily visible inside the moon's orbit. None are. And he goes on about the impossibility of the moon accidentally coming into orbit around the Earth. Amen. It's ludicrous. Yet in Genesis uh, chapter 1, we see God said he set it in place. 
But again, in most people's minds, maybe in some of your minds, well, God just put it there. No, he had to follow the laws of physics and put it in place. He, he established when he created the universe. And he didn't just do it on the earth. He did it throughout our solar system. Does anybody have a guess of how many known moons we found in our solar system? I need to go to my notes. Let's hear a guess. 27. 27, 30, 30, 30, 35. Oh, it's in the other notes. Hang on. There we go. We have in our solar system known 293 moons. Almost 300 known moons in our solar system. And nobody can explain how a single one got there. God put the one around the earth knowing someday we would, we would develop telescopes. And he's saying, they think it's neat that there's one moon up there. Wait till I blow their mind. Every one of them following precise laws of physics to stay in their orbits. It's amazing. Amen. And so I want to talk about some of these theories uh, this morning that uh, govern moon placement or how do they get there. But first of all, I want to talk again about I assume these are erasers. Man has gotten very adept at putting satellites in orbit. I mean, when we put the first satellite in orbit around the Earth, everybody was amazed. Wow. But now they're going up virtually weekly. We're putting satellites up in orbit. And some are falling out. Others have been up there for decades, right? And uh, the one particular satellite that we are so dependent upon are called geosynchronous or geolocational. In other words, how many in here have satellite TV? Anybody? Am I the only one has satellite TV? It's not a trick question. I wasn't going to call you up here. You're getting internet through satellite communication. Uh, you might have internet. And what's neat about Satellite TV, internet, is there's a satellite up in the earth, above the earth, that stays in the same place relative to you all the time. I've gotten to point, anybody beside me pointed any satellite dishes before. I used to, used to install, a, oh, what was the name of it? Christian, Sky, Sky, Sky Dish? I forget the name of it. It was Christian broadcasting through their own satellite. Sky Angel. Yes, yeah, Sky Angel. I used to install Sky Angel satellite dishes. And the satellite was somewhere up above Colorado, if I remember right. You had to, you had to uh, get your compass out and your protractor and measure the angle just to get it pointed right at that spot. Because that, that satellite's always in the same spot above the Earth. But how many of the satellites still moving? It's just moving at the same rate that the Earth is rotating. Which means, see, for, for a circular orbit, every height above the Earth, no matter how high, has only one velocity it can be moving at. Just one. If the velocity is too high, the centrifugal force is too high, and it spins out into further space. It takes a larger orbit. If the velocity is too low, gravity will pull it in, and it will crash back to Earth. So every satellite based on the altitude it is at, has one velocity it can run at to be geosynchronous. Amen. So we have calculated how high would the satellite have to be above the Earth. Understand the Earth has a radius of 3,960 miles. 3,960. How high do you think a satellite would be to be geosynchronous around the Earth? Anybody got a guess? I mean, no. 
No guesses? 26 miles. 26 miles. Any other guesses? 25. Bong, da bong, da bong. Understand, these satellites that are geosynchronous are all at the exact same height above the Earth. The exact same one. Going the exact same speed, or else they would, they would move quicker than the Earth spins or slower. The altitude that a satellite has to be to be geosynchronous is 2,000 I'm sorry, 22,236 miles above the surface of the earth. 26,199 miles above the center of the earth. So those geosynchronous satellites are way up there. That's over a tenth of the distance to the moon. We had to launch these satellites way out. And then you have to turn them and fire rockets to get them moving at the right speed. Precisely to get those geosynchronous. It's just an engineering work of art. And people say, I don't know why we need all that algebra stuff. Somebody needed to put that satellite in space at the right spot. So we can get our satellite TV and watch MMA. <laughs> Amen. It's amazing the brilliance it took to put these things in orbit. And the stupid stuff we stream on. Sister wives. What would you say? Shark week. Shark week, yes. True, crazy. What a misuse of this brilliance. Amen. And the speed. I didn't write that down. The speed at 22,000 miles to go around the earth is immense. To go around once every 24 hours. In fact, some of you can calculate that real quick now. So, again, these are precise laws. And they have 293 moons in the solar system obeying these exact laws and staying in orbit to me demonstrates God put them there. Now, again, I want to take just a few minutes. Is this okay with you so far? These things interest me. They may bore you to tears. I don't know. But, you know, when you get home, you can go watch Shark Week. Just, Just kidding. kidding. Some, Some of the, the main, main formulas, formulas that govern, govern not govern, govern that, that are, let me restate, restate that whole thing. thing. Some, Some of the, the main, main theories that have been projected, projected how the moon, moon got in its position. position. The, the number, number one theory that's postulated, postulated now is impact. impact. Is, is that, that another, another planet, planet about, about the size, size of Mars hit the, the Earth? And, and when, when it, it did, did gravity. gravity. I can get that. Thank, Thank you. you. Oops. I just, I, just had, I just had a random thought. I used to shoot a lot of pool when I was in college and such. And uh, if somebody was near you, you'd always hit them with a the cue stick and go blue dot. <laughs> Put chalk marks on them or whatever. Anybody else ever do that? Anyway, I couldn't resist. I had to do a blue dot. Impact. And what it says is that another planet, they say about the size of Mars, hit the earth, broke off part of the earth, and became the moon. And of course, uh, Dr. Walt Brown says that's virtually impossible. There'd be too much debris out in space. Uh, in that theory, it has to become molten and turn back into a sphere. And there's just too many things have to happen that are too ridiculous to happen one time, but to happen 293 times. Impossible. Now understand, a lot of the moons around other planets are not circular. They're elliptical. But still, they're following precise laws to stay in those orbits. Now, I remember being in engineering school, you know, it's been three or four years ago or more. And uh, what was my book dated 1972? Uh, 
is I remember studying, and I was, I was not saved. But they were teaching us these laws of, of orbital trajectory. And one of the things they taught us was, is that if you fire a projectile from the earth, it's going to take one of three paths. It's going to take a hyperbolic path if the velocity is high enough, and it's just going to escape the earth. If it's at an exact specific point, it can be parabolic and still escape the earth. But if it's within a certain range, it will orbit the earth if it's low enough. So if you shoot a cannon shell with enough velocity that it gets out into space, gravity will pull it into a circular arc and it will orbit the earth. Probably not elliptical, but it will orbit the earth. But based on the laws of ballistics that govern projectiles, the force of gravity always makes that projectile come back to its originating point. What I mean is, is I have the earth here, and I fire a projectile into the air. It can take a hyperbolic path, parabolic path, or an elliptical path, if I can get this to work. But the thing is, that elliptical path always governs, it comes back right to where it started, which means it hits the earth again. If you're trying to tell me that something hit the earth and broke a piece off, it becomes a projectile, and it's going to come right back to where it was broken off and hit the earth again. Potentially hit the earth again, hit the earth again. Before long, you don't have much of an earth. The theories of impact do not hold water. Yet this is the predominant thing taught in schools today. How we got the moon. And scientists that will actually be truthful with themselves will say, that's impossible. But they have to come up with some kind of theory that rules out God setting it in place. The same laws that govern ballistics always govern, also govern capturing a uh, moon. Some of the moons are floating out there, and the earth captures a moon. The, the preciseness of speed versus where it intersects the earth's gravitational field makes it extremely difficult ever to, to capture a moon, or much else for that matter. How much other stuff do we see circling around the earth? Just the moon. If capture was real, we would see all kinds of stuff circling the earth. But it's not there. Amen. Capture is a flawed theory. And science knows it doesn't work. They know you can't capture anything. So let me erase this again. Keep putting my erasers in the wrong spot. Somehow it's Pastor Bob's fault. Since my wife's not here for me, blame her. And Patty really wanted to come this weekend, but she's guarding fuzzy varmints. <laughs> so capture. There's somehow something's floating out there and you just grab it. And again, we know going around the solar system, there are some asteroids. There are some comets. They're not that common. You follow me? You can come near us. If moons were floating around all that common, you think we'd still see moons flying around. But we don't. We see planets coming around the sun that have their own moons. That's got to boggle science's mind. Not only does somehow the sun capture a planet, but it captured 50 moons of its own, all following precise laws of physics. So, capture does not work. Another problem with capture is, let me draw my earth back up here. Say this is the earth or any planet, and I've got a moon out here. This formula that attracts them together is that law of gravitation. And if you remember the law of gravitation is that law is the force of attraction, Gravity equals G 
mass of the earth times the mass of the moon over the r radius between them squared. One of the major factors governing gravitational force is mass. So let's say I've got a moon out here following its orbit, but there's other stuff coming along. The vast majority of anything coming near the earth captured by its gravitational pull is not going to orbit the earth. What do you suppose it would do? We know the moon out here, another one. We'll call it moon two. It's captured. It's going to crash into the earth. How many have seen shooting stars? That's debris out in space that our gravitational field captured, brought it in, and it hits the earth. And we see major you know, meteorite storms at times coming in hitting, right? Well, if you've got large objects out there and they're hitting the earth, can you imagine the crater size? But they also add mass to the earth. Do you follow me? I mean, if I've got two or three moons hitting the earth, I've just basically at least increased the mass of the earth by 50%. And all of a sudden, because I've increased this mass because other stuff is hitting, far more stuff would hit than would be captured. Do you follow me? Because these are precise laws. You could even have a capture where maybe it comes close. You got a moon coming in close, moon three, but the velocity is not high enough or the orbit's too low, and it'll actually spiral into the earth. Most stuff the earth is going to capture is it going to fly on by or hit the earth. Very little is actually going to orbit for very long. Which means this mass goes up here and based on the law of universal gravitation, aren't you loving physics right now? Based on the law of gravitational, uh, <laughs> gravitational force, if you increase the mass of the earth, the force between the earth and the original moon greatly increases. So what happens to this moon? See, if you've got stuff hitting the earth at a high level where you can capture something, it's going to so change the, the, the mass of the earth, everything else is going to crash in. And science knows these things. And they know their, their laws, I'm sorry, their theories of moon placement do not hold water. But they're so determined to reject the thought of a creator putting things in place, they say, well, it must have happened in this totally impossible scenario because otherwise we'd have to believe in God. The most ridiculous theory that exists in humanity is evolution bioevolution, that life was created out of nothing. There was so much evidence proving that impossible. Yet science says, well, we have to believe in it because that's the only theory we can come up with. Otherwise, we have to believe in a creator God. Yes. And Dr. Walt Bryant had enough internal truth integrity to recognize what he believed all of his life was fraudulent. He believed in lies science was putting out. It's just amazing. If you want to get printed in a science, uh, science book, science journal, it's got to be approved by those in charge. And the devil's made sure the people that are in charge of these things don't believe in God. So you're not going to find textbooks supporting creation. I have a book at home that I got in college, Principles of Thermodynamics. Yes. Just let it soak up. <laughs> that talk about laws of energy, energy transfer. And one of the primary laws of uh, thermodynamics is that everything in the universe is winding down. It's called entropy. Did anybody have any coffee for breakfast? 
Okay, one person raised their hand. Two or three kind of nodded a little bit. If you take, how many like hot coffee? Anybody like hot coffee? How many like lukewarm coffee? It was all the same to me. It was just, it was coffee when I drank it. But I've been born again. <laughs> if you take your hot coffee and put it on the counter, after a while, unless you have a Yeti cup, it's going to get cold. Right? And there's nothing you can do looking at that cup that's going to make it get hot again. The only way to make it get hot again is to add more energy to it to heat it back up. And physics, the second law of thermodynamics, says any process in the universe that takes place where there's energy transfer is never perfect. There's always some loss of energy. And because of that, the entire universe is in a steady burnout. If God doesn't intervene in a few trillion years, the universe is going to cease to exist by burnout. Just made up the number. What's that? I saw a, a Woody Allen movie, a clip of one years ago. I don't, I don't know the name of the movie, but it was Woody Allen when he was a little boy. And was, they couldn't get him to eat. They couldn't get him to do his homework. Couldn't get him to do anything. And he's seeing a therapist. And the therapist says, why won't you eat? Why won't you do your homework? Why won't you do anything around? Why won't you go have fun? And Woody Allen, as a little kid, says, I learned in school that the entire universe is burning out in so many trillion years, we're going to have you know, total burnout. Nothing will exist. And the therapist says, well, what's that got to do with you not wanting to eat or do your homework? He says, what's the use? Everything is in burnout, and science, it's a law. It's as much a law of the universe as gravitation is, and we know it. Much of my classwork in engineering was based on using that law in my calculations. How much energy is lost to entropy, it's called. And uh, in my thermodynamics book, I believe it was page 248, it just stuck out on me. What's so funny? I've been to it a couple times. So it's, anyway, I still got the book. And it says at the back of the chapter on entropy, the laws of entropy prove this universe had a beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He says it proves that, that there was a beginning to time, there was a start, a wind up the entire universe. And the book said, we choose to believe that wind up was produced by uh, a creator God. Write my college textbook. Try to find that in a textbook today. You're not going to find it. They've written God out of everything. Why? Because if it has God in it, it won't be published. And you won't get any grants. But science knows these moon theories are bogus. A third theory of moon placement Moon existence, moon formation is a dust cloud. That at one time going around the earth was a big cloud of dust. And the attractive force of those dust particles over billions of years came together as the moon. All the gases came together. When in fact physics shows that particles tend to and gases especially tend to expel from one another versus come together. And the entire theory is ridiculous. Amen. However, my question is, because that dust cloud, see if the dust cloud is all around here, around the earth, it can't form a moon. That dust is going to be attracted to the earth and fall to earth. That dust particle operates just like a moon. It's got to be going around the earth at the exact velocity based on its altitude to stay in orbit. And that dust cloud is going to just start collapsing to the earth if the velocity isn't exactly perfect. Amen. So my question would be, how did the dust cloud get at the exact altitude and velocity to stay there? 
This cloud would have had to have been placed in position. Well, I didn't think of that. One of the most ridiculous theories, and somebody may get offended by this, is that we're the result of aliens visiting the earth. Wow. What verse is that? <laughs> Demons have been putting together this theory for, for thousands of years, trying to get people to believe in extraterrestrials, worship them, even make them gods. Amen. To pull people away from the mindset, the original understanding, this is done by Creator God. At the time of Noah, everybody knew it was Creator God. Satan had to come up with ploys to get people away from that revelation, that knowledge. And now he's put together all this evidence for aliens. Amen. We came from aliens. Well, for me, the natural question is, where did the aliens come from? And people say, where did God come from? I mean, really, but where did God come from? He lives outside of this universe. You find He lives in the eternal realm that we, our natural minds, cannot comprehend. I can't comprehend infinity. I can't comprehend one billion. Anything I can't count to, I can't comprehend. It's just... A trillion. National debt is how many trillion dollars now? How much money is that? Wow, we can't imagine. Our mind was not built to go beyond certain levels of comprehension. One of those is eternity. Past. We can think of an eternity future. We've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as a sun. We've no less days to sing His praise than when we first begun. Man, that just came to me. <laughs> Amazing grace, grace, right? 10,000 10, years. 10,000 10, years is nothing, nothing compared to eternity. eternity. But well, we, we can, can imagine, imagine eternity, eternity future. future. We just keep going. Amen. Amen. I'd like to energize our body. But how do you comprehend eternity past? See, we are so locked in in the comprehension of time, we can't imagine a realm where time doesn't exist. Amen? Not built to. That's why we take it by faith that God has always been. He's outside the realm of time. When He produces universe, He created time. Amen? And now we're bound to it as long as we're in this earth suit. So, now we have the dust cloud. Impact, capture, dust cloud have all been totally disproven scientifically. Yet, one of them has to be true because there's the moon. Can I read you some statements? Oh, I'm going to anyway. Something else I want to mention before I get to it. Dr. Brown... And his calculations calculated the maximum amount of time the moon could have been in orbit around the earth. Now, the scientists are saying the universe is 26.3 or 4 billion years old or whatever. Up to 26. It used to be 13, now it's 26 billion. They needed more time for all these accidents to happen. But we know the moon every year is actually moving away from the earth. Let me draw this up here. All right. I'm going to believe you guys in a bigger chalkboard. What's that? I wasn't complaining. I wasn't trying to complain. I was just saying, I keep having to erase. <laughs> I got you. If here's the earth, and here's the moon, 240,000 miles away, if everything was, how can I say, 
under normal circumstances, the moon would circulate around the Earth at that exact orbit forever. But it's not. It's moving away from the Earth like a few inches a year, a few centimeters a year. I don't know. You could Google, I'm sure it would tell you. It's moving away from the Earth. And the reason is because on Earth, we have oceans. And every time the moon goes around the Every time the Earth rotates, the attraction, the gravitational attraction of the moon pulls on the water and it moves the water. How many know what it produces? Tides. Been somewhere where there's tides? Based on location, tides can be huge. And that's the result of the moon's attraction on the water on that side of the Earth as the Earth's rotating, pulling the water to it. And one of the formulas of physics is that for work. And work is defined as moving a mass over a distance. It's actually applying a force over a distance. Force times distance. And if something moves, if I push on this flower pot, I just did work. I applied a force with my thumb, it moved a distance, work was done. And when work is done, it requires energy. So every time the earth rotates, it's moving these waters. Work is being done. The waters are being moved by force of gravity. It uses energy, which drains away momentum from the moon. And what it's doing is it's forcing the moon to slow down to the earth, to, to a, what is it? Anyway, to move away from the earth a few inches, however far every year. 3.78 centimeters, so it's about three inches. No, inch and a half, inch and a half, inch and a half a year. 2.54 centimeters per inch, right? So, I know you knew that, I didn't need to say that. So the moon's moving away. So Dr. Brown decided to calculate if the universe is billions of years old, where would the orbit of the moon be in? If it's moving out, it's moving all this water. There had to be a beginning. And you discover if you go back far enough in time, the moon would have been circling right over the earth, ripping up everything, and that gravitational pull would have been so high it would have ripped up everything in the earth. And it came up with a distance, a maximum, let's say a minimum distance from the earth the moon could have been, and the earth still survived. And he calculated, based on moving all that mud water, how long would it take? Some phenomenal calculations. I wrote for him to him one time for him. He sent them to me. I think they're in his book now. And he came up with the Earth's, the moon's maximum age is 1.2 billion years. That time the tides would have been hundreds of feet high, just destroying everything. That would be the absolute maximum the moon could be. Well, it doesn't fit into the scientific narratives. But in truth, it would have been actually far less to keep things on Earth even somewhat in place. And certainly life could, could not have existed with the moon that close to 1.2 billion years ago. But again, it messes with the scientific narratives. So there are people looking at these things. Now, how long have I been going? 50 minutes? Let me read just a few comments from his book where he's looked at these lunar orbits. He says, If planets and moons evolve from swirling dust clouds as is commonly taught, each of the almost 220 known moons, now this is written a while back, now there's 293, and the solar system should orbit its planet in the same direction. In other words, according to the laws of physics, it would have to go in the same direction as the planet spins. But more than 30 moons have black backward orbits. Scientifically impossible. Well, those were formed through a different method. So two impossibilities came together around the same planet. Amen. Uh, further, 
Furthermore, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune have moons orbiting in both directions. I bet God had fun with that one. <laughs> Let them see this <laughs> The orbit of each of these moons should, be lie, should lie near, very near the equatorial plane of the planet it orbits, but many, including Earth's orbit, or, or Earth's moon, are in highly inclined orbits. Just doesn't follow any physics laws we know of. And we're pretty good with physics. We can put the satellites in orbit. That's another thing. When we put a satellite in orbit, you just don't blast it off from the Earth and it goes into orbit. They have to send it up to a certain altitude, turn it, and fire more rockets to get it at the exact velocity they need. Amen. And we have to be very precise with it. Yet this all happened by accident. Let me skip that part. If the moon were billions of years old, it should have accumulated a thick layer of dust and debris from it from meteorite bombardment. Basically, what this was is we can measure how much dust is coming on the earth on the moon every year. There's so many millimeters of dust, meteorite dust, attracted to the moon every year. And if the moon was actually billions of years old, the depth of the dust accumulated on the moon should be miles deep. How many have heard of Isaac Asimov? Great science fiction writer. He predicted the dust on the moon would be miles deep. He said the first spaceship that lands on the moon will disappear into a sea of dust. So when they built the first moon lander, anybody remember that? July, July 20th, 1969. If you look at the lunar module that landed, there's these giant pads for feet. You know why they did that? They were predicting it to sink into the great sea of dust. They put big pads on the feet, didn't need them. So when it landed, they did not know if it would survive the landing or not, or if it would just disappear. They really didn't know. And so how many have heard of the first words that Neil Armstrong said when he descended upon the moon? Right? One small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. We all know that one. At least have heard it. You know what the actual first words he said when he stepped on the moon? He stepped and he goes, my God, it's solid. True story. They don't record that part. Why well, it interferes with the evolutionary billions of year mantra. Almost no dust on the earth proving a young, I'm sorry, on the moon, proving a young moon. Uh, He's got many different scientists talking over the impossibility, references them talking about the impossibility of moon formation by accident. But this was a one I want to quote if I can find it. Hang on just one second. The current explanations for moon formation had many other problems. Understanding caused them, understanding the problems caused one expert to joke the best explanation for the moon is observational error. It's not really there. <laughs> Yet it is there. And the only way it could get there to follow what God put in Genesis chapter 1. He set it in place. The earth going around the sun follows these same laws. Has an elliptical orbit that allows us to experience summer and winter, right? Spring and fall. Allows life to function like it does. And put all that... See, we think about creating all this stuff on the earth to have this great 
you know, biosphere that we live in. And yet, God also had to put the earth in an exact orbit for, the, let this, for, for this biosphere to even exist. Because if it's off just a little bit, the ice never melts. If it's off just a little bit, everything overheats. If it's off just a bit, life cannot exist on earth. And God put it in a precise orbit position for us to be able to thrive in His kingdom. Did you get anything out of this?